Hello, my name is Jiso, and I'm reading Master Dogen's Shobogenzo, and I got a little bit behind, but I'm finally trying to catch up here. We are reading Gyoji, Part 2, Pure Conduct and Observance of Precepts. And we are flying through page, uh, sorry, paragraph 214. We still have over 15 pages of Gyoji to read, so I'm not going to finish it today. Taiso, the second patriarch in China, titled Great Master Shoshu Fukaku, was a teacher of lofty virtue and a man of erudition, adored by both gods and demons, and esteemed by both monks and laymen. He lived for many years between the rivers Ai and Raku. E, sure, it's river E. Let's go for E during which time he widely read various books. He was considered to be one of the country's rare individuals, the like of whom a person could not easily meet. Because of his eminence in Dharma and the weight of his virtue, a mystical being suddenly appeared and told the patriarch, If you want to reap the fruit of your efforts, why do you linger here? The great truth is not far away. You must go south. The next day, he suffered a sudden headache, a stabbing pain. His master, Zen master Kozan Hojo of Ryuman Mountain in Rakuyo, was about to cure the pain when a voice from the sky said, This is a change to the skull. It is not an ordinary pain. Then the patriarch told the master about his meeting with the mystical being. When the master looked on top of the patriarch's skull, Lumps had swelled up like five mountain peaks. Master Kozan said, Your physiognomy is a good omen. You will surely attain realisation. The reason the mystical being told you to go south must be that the great man Bodhidharma of Shorinji Temple is destined to become your master. Hearing this advice, the patriarch left at once to visit Shoshitsu Ho Peak, the mystical being was a truth-guarding deity which belonged to the patriarch's own long practice of the truth. At that time, it was December and the weather was cold. They say it was the night of the ninth day of the twelfth month. Even if there had been no great snowfall, we can imagine that a high peak deep in the mountains on a winter night was no place for a man to be standing on the ground outside a window. It would have been dreadful weather at that time of year, cold enough even to break the joints of bamboo. Nevertheless, with the great snow covering the earth, burying the mountains and submerging the peaks, Taiso Eka beat a path through the snow. How severe should we suppose it was? Eventually, he arrived at the patriarch's room, but he was not allowed to enter. The patriarch seemed not to notice him. That night he did not sleep, did not sit and did not rest. He stood firm, unmoving, and waited for dawn. The night snow fell as if without mercy, gradually piling up and burying him to his waist, while his falling tears froze one by one. Seeing the tears, he shed more tears. He reflected on himself and reflected upon himself again. He thought to himself, when people in the past sought the truth, they broke their own bones to take out the marrow. They drew their own blood to save others from starvation. They spread their own hair over mud and they threw themselves off cliffs to feed tigers. Even the ancients were like this. And who am I? As he thought such thoughts, his will became more and more determined. Students of later ages should not forget what he says here. Even the ancients were like this. And who am I? When this is forgotten, even for an instance, there instant, there are eternal kalpas of depression. As Taiso Eka thought thus to himself, his determination to pursue the Dharma and to pursue the state of truth only deepened. Perhaps he was like this because he did not see the means of purity as a means. To imagine what it was like that night as dawn approached, is enough to burst one's gallbladder. The hair on one's flesh simply bristles with cold and fear. At dawn, the first patriarch took pity on him and asked, 
What are you after, standing there in the snow for such a long time? Questioned thus, his tears of sorrow falling in ever greater profusion, the second patriarch said, Solely I beg, Master, that out of compassion you will open the gate to, to nectar and widely save all beings. Hello, doggy. Come here. Can I say hello to the people? I don't say hello to the people. Hmm? Okay. Um, save all. Okay, I'm going to have to pause it because the dog needs a wee. Hang on a sec. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Here he is. Say hello to the people. Yes. Yes. You're a Zen doggy now. He's a good boy. Famous on YouTube. Yes. Yes, you are. Right. Um, <laughs> kind of lost my thread there. So imagine what it was like that night as dawn approached is enough to burst one's gallbladder. Let's go back there. The hair on one's flesh simply bristles with cold and fear. At dawn, the first patriarch took pity on him and asked, what are you after standing there in the snow for such a long time? Questioned thus, his tears of sorrow falling in ever greater profusion, the second patriarch said, Solely I beg, Master, that out of compassion you will open the gate to nectar and widely save all beings. When Teso Eka, Eka had spoken thus, the first patriarch said, The Buddha's supreme and wondrous state of truth is to preserve the vast Kalpas to become able to practice what is hard to practice and to endure what is beyond endurance. How can one hope to seek the true vehicle with small virtue and small wisdom and with a trivial and conceited mind? It would be futile toil and hardship. As he listened then, the second patriarch was by turns edified and encouraged. Secretly, he took a sharp sword and severed his left arm. When he placed it before the master, the first patriarch could then see that the second patriarch was a vessel of the Dharma. So he said, when in the beginning the Buddhas pursued the truth, they forgot their own bodies for the sake of the Dharma. Now you have cut off your arm before me. In your pursuit also there is something good. From this time forward, he entered the master's inner sanctum. He served and attended the master for eight years through thousand myriads of exertions. Truly, he was a great rock beneath human beings and gods and a great guiding teacher of human beings and gods. Exertion like this was unheard of even in the Western heavens. It happened for the first time in the Eastern lands. We learn the face breaking into a smile from the ancient saint but we learn getting the marrow under this patriarch. Let us quietly reflect. No matter how many thousand myriads of first patriarchs had come from the West, if the second patriarch had not maintained the practice, there could be no today. There could be today no satisfaction in learning and no handling of the great matter. Now that we today have become people who see and hear the right Dharma, we should unfailingly repay our debt of gratitude to the patriarch. Extraneous methods of a payment, repayment, will not do. Bodies and lives are not sufficient. Nations and cities are not important. Nations and cities can be plundered by others and bequeathed to relatives and children. Bodies and lives can be given over to the impermanent. They cannot be committed to a lord or entrusted to false ways. Therefore, to intend to repay our gratitude through such means is not the way. Simply to maintain the practice day by day. Only this is the right way to repay our gratitude. The principle here is to maintain the practice so that the life of every day is not neglected and not wasted on private pursuits. 
For what reason? Because this life of ours is a blessing left over from past maintenance of the practice. It is a great favour bestowed by maintenance of the practice, which we should hasten to repay. How lamentable, how shameful it would be to turn skeletons whose life had been realised through a share of the virtue of the Buddha's patriarchs, maintenance of practice, into the ideal play, sorry, into the idle playthings of wives and children, to abandon them to the trifling of, of wives and children, without regret for breaking precepts and debasing pure conduct. It is out of wrongness and madness that people give over their body and life to the demons of fame and profit. Fame and profit are the one great enemy. If we are to assign weight to fame and profit, we should really appreciate fame and profit. Really to appreciate fame and profit means never to entrust to fame and profit and thereby cause to be destroyed the body and life which might become a Buddhist patriarch. Appreciation of wives, children and relatives also, also should be like this. Do not study fame and profit as phantoms in a dream of flowers in space. Study them as they are to human beings. Do not accumulate wrongs and retribution because you have failed to appreciate fame and profit. When the right eyes of learning and practice widely survey all directions, they should be like this. Even a worldly person who has any human feeling on receiving charity through gold, silver or precious goods will return the kindness. The friendliness of gentle words and a gentle voice spurs in all who have a heart the goodwill to return kindness. What kind of human being could ever forget the great blessing of seeing and hearing the Tathagata's supreme right dharma? Never to forget this blessing is itself a lifelong treasure. A skeleton or a skull that has never regressed or strayed in this maintenance of the practice has, at the time of life and at the time of death, equally such virtue that it deserves to be kept in a stupor of the seven treasures and to be served offerings by all human beings and gods. Having recognised that we hold such a great debt of gratitude, we should without fail, without letting our life of dew on grass fall in vain, wholeheartedly repay the mountain-like virtue of the second patriarch. This is maintaining the practice. The merit of this maintaining the practice is already present in us who are maintaining the practice as patriarch or Buddha. In conclusion, the first patriarch and the second patriarch never founded a temple. They were free from the complicated business of mowing undergrowth. And the third patriarch and the fourth patriarch were also like that. The fifth patriarch and the sixth patriarch did not establish their own temple as Saigen and Nangaku were also like that. I think I'm going to leave it there because Great Master Sakito lashed together a thatched hut. I think we'll have his thatched hut tomorrow. Just that note there about mowing undergrowth, clearing a site for the building of a temple. Okay. Okay. Well, more on Kyoji next time. Thank you for listening. Take care.